This is a test. This station was conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. <laughs> This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system. All right, smashing. Uh, I thought a good place to start, actually, is I was envious that I live in London and not in your part of the world, and I couldn't be at the Fort Apache tribute. Was that was that this weekend gone? Yeah, it was this past weekend, yeah. How, how was that? Oh, it was... Uh, I posted about how, how much of a love fest it was. It was just incredible to be around these people that I've been you know, sort of family to in a lot of ways, or, or at least very close friends in all cases, going back 30 something years and to pay tribute to um, not only Gary Smith and uh, the studio and, and, and the legacy that, that um, this, this studio sort of was uh, an incub as an incubator of, um, you know, sort of our creative youth, uh, but sort of just a tribute to the ongoing music that we've all, uh, been part of and um, you know and just the friendships uh, there there as well and you know we even did a little tribute with one of my brothers singing um, the song uh, a song by my uh, just recently deceased brother who, who died a year ago Paul who was in a band called Coldwater Flat so we got the rhythm section of that band Coldwater Flat and we did a, a tribute to that they were on Fort Apache Records uh, which was the, even closer to the the whole sort of scene so it was a real it was stuff like that and just collaborations of different bands and artists coming up during other people's sets it was you know as as, as wonderful as you could expect it to be i feel like i need to um sort of like start the push to get the cold water flat record on spotify it's not it's not there and quite often when i'm making a i can't even remember the, the name of the song but i used to there was a there was a, a fort apache compilation tape that I think was on the cover of the enemy or the melody maker when I was a kid like fuzzy were on that cassette as well and like mm -hmm. Juliana Hatfield and I just yeah. remember being obsessed with that song and every so often I look for it and it's not on Spotify so can you do something about that please no I can't <laughs> I don't know how, uh, how this all works but um yeah it's uh the song is called uh, magnetic north pole that's the one that's the one when I because when I was a when I was a kid, I was confused. I thought that was the name of the band and not the song. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's on uh, it's on uh, YouTube anyway. But yeah, I hear you. I mean, you know, and certain artists are just not there at all, like Belly and 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 those guys took their music off of streaming services. I was. It was a great day, though. Speaking of, uh, I think I think they're Boston, but I was an enormous fan of that band Scarce. And, oh yeah, and their record Dead Sexy, which was a. I think he's one of the best debut records ever made. Actually, like <laughs> there, there was there was some kind of like Boston music compilation that they had a few songs on that was on Spotify. But when Dead Sexy went up, that was a that was a, that was a great day. So anyway, <laughs> I, I was very I was very sad to hear about your brother. Uh, I saw a thing that you wrote about him, and I thought it was a really kind of brave and raw piece of writing. But I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like any kind of. I shouldn't say any kind, but with a lot of sibling relationships, you know, it's, 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 it was, it wasn't all just, uh, we were like brothers. I mean, it was like, you know, like brothers means it can be very fraught. <laughs> and yeah. with Paul, you know, Paul was a difficult guy in a lot of ways, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll always remember him as my, as my little brother. Yeah. No. Um, well, talking about the new record, um, it's, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a, uh, the time I've spent with it, I think that it's a, a, a great record, but it's also, I think, quite understated. Um, you know, quite a lot. Of, the songs have a bit of a quite a lilt to them. They're quite gentle in lots of ways. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of um, we we in our in our history of whatever ten records that we've done, we we've rarely gone on gone in with um, 
I'm going to sort of see if I can temper this. I mean, we don't, we don't really, at least the last few records, we didn't really go in with a, a template in mind, but with this, we were writing so much um, and, and we were kind of ready to, to get right back into the studio um, back after our last record, which was about 2017 or so. But then by the time we kind of got done with that COVID hit and, um, and it kind of put the kibosh on, on the plans, but so we were writing a lot, Chris and I in particular, and sending each other all these different uh, demos, which are almost always our, our, our modus operandi is to send acoustic demos pretty much. Um, but this, these songs almost uh, were, wanted to seem to stay with an acoustic sort of thrust. And um, so much so that Tom McGinnis proposed doing kind of an acoustic record, quote unquote. Um, so I thought it would be even more acoustic of a record than than it turned out to be. But 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 by doing the basic tracks with an acoustic guitar and Tom kind of stripping down his drum set and using kind of those hot rod type sticks, it, it is it, it it gave it as you said a, a gentler approach from the get go. And l the songs had it's hard to generalize about them all, but there really kind of was this almost. 60s ish vibe to you know kind of late 60s maybe stonesy aftermath meets you know dylan this you know blah 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 so it's kind of like that classic stuff that we've almost always done is to me it's just I, I don't know if anybody would unless they're really closely listening like yourself would would be able to detect much of a difference between <laughs> this and any other record we've done but i mean to me it really came out sounding more like of our records from our past something like big red letter day which had a lot of acoustic guitar up in the front but that's how we grew up, you know, Stones, Zeppelin, whatever, right on to Replacements and R.E.M., big Neil Young, always acoustic guitar, even on some of the more rocking songs. Yeah, I, I think I just, um, I mean, I suppose any, you know, you're a big Stones guy, aren't you? Like, you know, we all have our favourite eras. And, you know, I was I was obsessed with your self-titled record when I was when I was much younger. And I mean, obviously, there's there's the uh, the wailings of, of of younger men on that record you know so <laughs> i suppose this record does feel quite distinct i mean obviously we're, we're 38 years on or or whatever it is but um it definitely felt like there was a it definitely felt like there was a grace to it compared to a lot of where you've been in in your discography i think oh thank you yeah i, th I think so as well i mean you know uh I we we're well past the point of where maturing was a bad word, you know, but now it's like, we're just happy to be around. <laughs> oh, well, well t tell me about that though, because I mean, you know, I, I, I've been quite nervous about having this conversation because I really can't express how much sort of how devoted I was to your band in my teens. But I also, I kind of, my fandom was at a time when your band weren't operational you know, I was I was saying to Steve Phillips, the wonderful man that does your PR in the UK. I was saying that I was at South by South South by Southwest one year, sort of towards the end of the noughties, and I was sat in the hotel room reading the free newspaper, trying to work out what I was going to see that day. And I saw that Buffalo Tom were playing, and I was so amazed that Buffalo Tom were playing. I didn't even know you'd reformed or you'd got back together at that point that I actually rang the venue to say, "Is it the Buffalo Tom?" <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, I suppose your band, you know, you are, you know, you are, your name means something, but there's also, I never know how to say things like this without it sounding offensive, which is why I front loaded it with <laughs> loads of how much I love your band. I, I guess that like, I mean, you know, there were some of your peers maybe kind of like burned brighter, you know, than perhaps before Tom did. So do you really feel just grateful to be here or is is there a kind of a, a sliver of oh we should have enjoyed some of those spoils oh no uh, more the former now i mean there, it's it's not to say that i didn't go through personally I, I can't speak for the other guys so much uh but personally i certainly went through uh those uh why not us kind of moments but we i think you know the problem the the, the problem and the benefit of being in buffalo tom is that we've where you can't find sort of more three level headed guys. Like I'm the more off the, off the rails type guy in the band. And I'm like, a, I'm as kind of as pragmatic as you get for a rock and roll guys. But those guys are just like, you know, it's like we always kept each other in check and you always have to remind yourself and keep perspective of like, what did we expect when we started? We, it was, 
you know, it was 1986. It was like Bon Jovi on the radio and maybe Guns N' Roses were starting to come through. So that was as kind of daring as it got in the United States. You know, I, I remember we were sort of getting ready to make our record and and it's like, oh, The Cure are getting onto top 40 radio in America. I mean, it's, it was different in England, you know. Um, it was still very conservative and it was such a big major label type of time. So, you know, when Who's Could Do is signed to a major label, it was like a lot of hand wringing and, you know, replacements are going to be on SNL, Saturday Night Live. And, oh, my God, what does this mean for the underground? You know, but but the underground in, in America especially has always gone through these these moments. I mean, I'm writing this book about the cars now, and it's like there was all this hand wringing about like, oh, our, you know, I, I remember reading this article recently. It's like uh, from 1978. It's like, well, if the cars are having success, does that mean success now for Blondie? And, oh, even the Ramones, are they going to be? You know, of course they were. These are big legacy bands, but it, it was this kind of stuff always happened. But for us, it was like, it really was like, let's try to get a tour together. Let's, oh, we can get a record out on SST Records. Oh, my God, now we're on Beggar's Banquet in the UK. Now we're touring over here, and now we can headline in Boston finally after coming over seas and then coming back. That's a, the only time we could kind of headline in Boston because it was so, it was so, it was such a rich time. So we keep moving these goal lines, you know, and, um, it was like, uh, well, now Nirvana breaks. Well, Ooh, now we can make a, now our, all of a sudden our budget for our record went up and we we're making videos for a hundred fucking thousand dollars, whatever it was, you know? So everything started to become really, uh, possible. So when other bands came from, you know, uh, that maybe even would cite us as an influence that came after us and all of a sudden had this, their first record be, a big selling record. Yeah. I mean, the difference between selling, you know, 50 or a hundred thousand records in America and, and 6 million is just like whether or not you get radio play and, and, and an MTV slot. So you can't help but get wrapped up into that. But I'll finish my rant and ramble here by saying that, you know, the perspective was always there, uh, keeping that level headedness that I alluded to, but certainly by the time we got back into this after taking a bit of a hiatus, then, it was all just, as we say, just all gravy in America. You know, it's like uh, it was, oh, there are people that still want to see us. Never mind that. There are people that travel to see us. There are people now that, you know, travel for two days to come and see us somewhere. And um, we don't take that for granted at all. And, and a lot of this has to do with now we're, I'm the I'm the young guy in the band and I'm about to be 58 in June. So um, it's like. Yeah. We're all still alive. You know, we talk about all this loss and all these other people. It's like we're three guys that are still the same guys in this in this in the same lineup in this band. And wow, what a what a fortunate spot to be in. I mean, you were sort of saying that, you know, within the three of you that, you, you know, you were kind of more I'm going to I'm going to fumble the way I'm presenting this, but, you know, more more of the kind of the rock and roll guy. And yet. The, the, there's kind of like limits to that because you are Bill Janowitz from Buffalo Tom and not, I don't know, Sid Vicious. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, what's this? What's the secret of enduring the amount of time that you have when so many people have, you know, burnt out or they're not here anymore? Like, what's the? How, how do you? How do you feel like you've just kept that together? Is it? Is it the temperament of the three of you? Yeah, I mean, there's no better example that when we, instead of breaking up in 99, when we, or whenever it was that we decided to take a step off of this cycle of touring and recording and touring and recording, which was, it was, it was not uh, extremely lucrative, but it was lucrative enough where we, we, we had houses and, you know, it was our, it was our only job. And, um, but, you know, when the kids started coming, we just didn't want to be out on the road that long. So it's like the bands that, didn't have to go out on the road that just sold so many records that, 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 you know, they could really pick and choose their times. And when they did go on the road, they made a lot more money. Well, for us, it was like this churn and it was really churning through us. And we were the, we were, we were the grain being churned and it was really wearing us out. So we just said, okay, let's take a break. You know, let's, we don't, we don't need to call our breakup. I mean, you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have broken it up. And so the reunion would have been a bigger deal that, you know, but we kind of didn't even stop, you know, 
uh, our biggest hit in the UK was the cover of Going Underground, which was a top six. I think it was number six on the top ten. And a lot of that had to do with being the 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 A side to a B side with uh, an Oasis track or something. So you know, we got into the charts, but we were on chart shows, things that we were never on as a, a, a as a, on our own. So that was like after that was like oh oh one or something like that. So. We never really stopped, stopped, you know, we kind of always played a gig or two a year at least. Um, so it was, but it really was taking the step back that has, uh, otherwise we would have, I don't know if, you know, we definitely would have broken up and probably reunited as well. What year was, what year was my so-called life? That was like 95 or six in there. I think 95. Because because it does like you, like you say, I mean, I, I went out and bought that. Uh, it, it was like a jam tribute that, that record wasn't it with with i think it was liam gallagher and paul weller on one side and you were on the other side didn't you did going underground right uh yeah we did going underground kind of a you know i think if we had done a, a, a cover with a with a real sort of just buffalo tom cover it would have been as close to the jam as as the jam itself you know yeah, like yeah. where this trio that played kind of like that but i think we wanted to really kind of do a different thing and uh yeah, it's like it's it's atypical for Buffalo Tom. It's certainly atypical for w- what the song is. But yeah, going underground. But did you feel? I don't know. I mean, I guess did you feel that? You, you know, you, you sort of said there about kids coming along and kind of maybe real life took over. But did you feel like the the the, the band needed to stop then, or the band needed to kind of go away, or you need you needed to have a break? Yeah, for me, I, I kind of wanted it to be over, honestly, and I wanted to kind of get something else going. Um, but I, uh, I don't know that I proposed breaking up per se. As like, you know, I think all of I, I, it doesn't really matter who uh, to me if 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 one of us just said, um, let's just uh, you know, let's not announce it. Yeah, I don't think it, there was also this presumption that anybody would really that many people would care. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm sure more many people would have cared, but um, yeah, I definitely needed the break. I, like I said, I wanted to kind of get get a another sort of si- side career or solo career going, and and for it to be a real thing. Because I mean, there was just this like, okay, we've been doing this for ten years on the road, you know, more than more like fourteen, fifteen years since we started, and it was like, uh, you know, I think we've rode this horse as far as it's going to go. And um, maybe we should all see other people <laughs> for a while. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was just a horrible time for the music business. I mean, everything sort of everything sort of hit at the same time. Our kids started coming. Consolidation of oh, here's the other thing. It's like if we had stayed on Beggar's Banquet, which was a possibility, as I recall, um, and just had that be our major. So that was our that was our father, our parent label, you know, and we were always licensed out to different labels around the world, including major labels in the United States. But so uh, there was this theory that I, that I had, I don't know how many other, the other guys shared it, but I feel like I had to convince them like, look, maybe if we sign directly to a, a major label in the United States, maybe we'll have be more of a priority to that label rather than just being some thing that they've inherited from beggar's banquet. And I remember having the good fortune. I mean, it was a good fortune for us to be on Beggar's Banquet, and I and I will always look at that as my, as one of our great feathers in our caps, is that we were part of that label and 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 able to work with people like you know Martin Mills, just a legendary figure, and all the people that were at the label, who are friends of ours to this day. And I just remember getting uh, to have lunch with Martin out at his house, you know, in, in out in out in Richmond. And him saying, you know, that you could do this, you could try to, but you should also sort of be happy as to where, you know, where you guys have developed and why do you feel the need, I think this is the nature of the conversation, to be, to go for some, the brass ring even more. And, uh, well, I mean, it had a lot to do with money, you know, and then having a nice secure living as opposed to just being a road hog. (laughs) And, uh, but I mean, just the fact that he took the time to meet with this, you know, it was like a really friendly thing. And, I think if we had stayed with beggars, maybe it would have insulated us more from the the the, the industry falling apart. Really, you know. So we ended up signing to Polydor. Blah blah blah. This is all very boring. But they were one of this one of these many labels under this A and M Seagram's Universal deal, where everything just sort of 
conglomerated and they dropped like 200 and something bands of which we were one. So it was like, oh, this is a very good time to take a break. You know, we had gotten paid for another record, which we never made. So it gave us a little bit of a buffer, you know, that kind of thing. I, I've just checked and the uh, the other side of your going under underground cover was Liam Gallagher and Steve Craddock from Ocean Colour Scene. So that was me correcting uh, um yeah, a, mis- a mistruth that I was about to put out into the world. Yeah, the song but, it was Carnation, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but but also, I guess you know Buffalo Tom. It's kind of ninety nine, isn't it? Where you, you kind of press pause on it. But Lonesome Billy, your first solo record's ninety six. Uh, I, I love that record. Is that you know is, is is there maybe aspirations creeping in at that point of going? I'd quite like to make music under my own name, or is it just that those are songs that you wanted to put out away from uh, away from Buffalo Tom? It was more the latter. I was just writing so much, and not all of it was, you know, very. I should say a small amount of it was was some stuff I'd be proud of now. But those were songs that I'm like, yeah, I could see why Buffalo Tom is not interested in doing this. I mean, we had to choose. They had to choose. We we couldn't do all the songs that I was writing. Never mind the ones that Chris was also writing. So it was just a matter of having all this stuff. And that particular record was the product of uh, our manager at the time, Tommy Johnston saying, uh, well, how about uh, sending these to Joey uh, Burns and John Convertino, who who were then just part of Giant Sand and had started this side project called um, Spoke. It wasn't yet Calexico, but they were doing, they were sort of doing this like almost Muscle Shoals type, come to Tucson and and work with us. You know, they did it with Nico Case and uh, and some other great artists. And, uh, you know, more like, let's provide a band and a setting for singer songwriters. So that was a great idea. And I love those guys and I still love those guys. And, um, it was one of the great experiences in, in, in my music uh, musical career was going to Tucson and doing this cool record. I wish I, you know, I like the record too, and I'm glad you do. I, I think I would have done some different things. I mean, I, I think I played it a little hokey here and there. I, I think I would have maybe done some more play to the band who, and the strengths of those guys and the scene. Um, but it was, I, I love a lot of those songs quite a bit. But yeah, that wasn't that wasn't so much like, let me go off on my own solo career. That was, I knew that was going to be a weirdo side project. Hey, listen, I was 16, so a lot of the music that you're referencing at that point, I I didn't know. Do you know what I mean? So I didn't hear yeah. any I didn't hear any hokiness. Um, <laughs> yeah, good. I, I, I have to say though, the it's amazing in all the time that I've spent interviewing musicians, how uh I don't want to say that kind of musicians not liking music, but that maybe they aren't very well versed in music. Um, and not to say that you are necessarily, I mean, I, I don't know whether you would consider yourself thus, but not to say that you are necessarily a music journalist, but because you've written so much about music, um, I, I'm very excited about the, the Cars book. And I did read your Stones book when I was when I was younger, and I keep meaning to read the Leon Russell book. Is mm-hmm. that kind of, um, you know, there's a song on the new record, which is basically is it new, new Girl Singing, which is about, almost sort of like an ode to some of your favourite or the band's favourite female voices. Is it kind of, I don't know, do you sometimes feel as a songwriter kind of weighted down by your your vast knowledge of the music which has preceded you? Or I don't know, it, it, I, 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 don't, I don't speak to a lot of musicians that really are so well-versed in the history of rock, so to speak. That's really interesting to me because I find, I, I, I feel like, like for when I start to talk, and I, I talk about these books a lot, the books that I've done, and, that I talk talk about them with other musicians. And like, I, I was just talking to Winston from Fuzzy, that you talked about Fuzzy uh, being on that, you know, they were at this Fort Apache thing. And, and Winston knew more about uh, Leon Russell than I did going into the Leon Russell book. And I find that I, among my peers of other musicians, uh, I, I, so many of them know way more about music than I do. Right. And there's this weird thing about like, uh, you know, I think about this quite often about like, um, about like if they play a certain kind, if people play a certain kind of music, that that must be all that they listen to. What I find uh, is is that uh, musicians tend to love way more uh, genres of music than their fans do, you know, and that we're all, I, I'm speaking as a sort of a cloth on behalf of most of my musician colleagues is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly impressed 
by the fact that, you know, uh, that, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody like Slash was a big student of like Elliot Easton, for example, just to kind of use a recent example. But I mean, that makes total sense. And you could take more extremes, like, you know, guys that play in whatever, black metal bands, you know, Norwegian death stuff, <laughs> are like, you know, jazz fans, or like, listen to Archie Shep, or whatever. It's like, I, I find that musicians are actually far more open. And But no, I don't feel, if anything, it's like, the more informed I am, and the more I try to learn, like, to play covers, and for example, I tried to, again, use a Cars example, I tried to learn the solo uh, of um, My Best Friend's Girl, and I I kind of posted it up on Instagram recently. And that's like, that's really like, it's a good, I've been playing guitar since I'm 13 years old or younger and uh, 12 maybe. And I'm, and there's still things that I've got to open up, unlock in the brain and, and, and in the, on the guitar neck. And the more broad you go, the more that informs your thing. And I, I never feel weighted down. If anything, I feel limited by, by, by my, by my own, you know, sort of inherent limitations of, of, and musical vocabulary. I think I might just be speaking to loads of stupid musicians, actually. <laughs> uh, maybe, 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 or maybe you're maybe you got to ask the, you know the right questions. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe it, it could it could come back on me as well. Um, I, I you know I, I will say on this note, I, I remember again talking about the, this also dovetails with the collapse of the music industry and then and then its rebirth uh, was was when Napster first came around and you would go into these uh, other people's libraries. These are anonymous anonymous users usually. And you would see, oh, I'm I'm looking for like this whatever uh, Black Sabbath bootleg or something. But then there'd be like all these show tunes next to these, like, <laughs> you know, Black Sabbath songs. So it's like most people contain multitudes. Yeah, I I, I have to say, I do love it with you know with the omnipresence of Spotify. I do love it when you will be listening to a band and they will have made a mixtape of their favorite songs or you know, songs from the band that they will post to their Spotify page. I do, I do think that's amazing. I just, yeah. I, think Sp I think Spotify is amazing. I just wish that they would pay people. I don't think that's, I don't think yeah. that's, I don't think that's and again, to ask. Yeah, and I think they do pay people. It's just that who 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 are the people that they're paying? You know, it's the deals that they made with with labels, which are, which are, you know, it's always the artists that get paid last. Yeah, my, my wife who works in music management, she is constantly arguing that it's not Spotify, it's, it's the kind of the middle of the sausage, you know. It's the right. It's the, the deals that the labels have made. But um, you mentioned Chris before. You were saying, well, just when we were talking about the dynamic of Buffalo Tom, I've always been interested in. I used to know this guy. He was blatantly a psychopath, but I used to know this guy that when you got in his car, he would he would listen to Husker Du records, but he cut out all the Grant Hart songs, so it hmm. would just be the Bob Mould songs. I always thought that was very weird. I think with you and with you and Chris, because it's like not like having two frontmen, but it's like having two very distinct voices. How has that worked over the years with the kind of the distribution of each of the songs? Oh, it's really who writes the song is that's who's singing it, and and the way we write is, um, and you know, we credit the band on every song. Uh, that's just a way of keeping the band, um, you know, a, 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 an equal through. And that's, you know, that's, this actually was maybe an answer to one of your earlier questions is like the longevity of the band. It's like, you know, again, I'm writing about the cars and and they were all integral to that, to the sound of that band. Uh, but it, it really was Rick writing the songs and he didn't even share any revenue, uh, never mind credit with any of the band, even though they were arranging and they're bitter about it to this day. And these are 70 something year old guys, you know, and uh, that prob that, you know, that band probably would not have lasted if they weren't at least getting some residual <laughs> huge, huge benefit from it. But, um, you know, Van Halen split their credits equally. The Clash at a certain point started splitting their credits and, and I don't know about the revenue, but presumably the revenue as well. So with Buffalo Tom, uh, that's kind of what we put in place from the get-go. And we very much, um, it also dictated a sort of spirit up to the band that no song is sacred. And first of all, they decide which of my songs they will want to do, of the ones I, I send to them. And like talks about, that's when we were talking about Lonesome Billy, it's like oh, all these over leftover songs. It's like, well, why didn't you choose these? Well, we can't choose all of them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and then so Chris, increasingly started to write more and bring more and more to the table uh, of original ideas 
rather than just, oh, I'm writing a counter melody to this Bill song, or I'm putting my own bass parts, or we're going to put a bridge here. I mean, he's actually bringing each record more songs. Um, and yet he doesn't want to sing many more in, 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 uh, in shows. Maybe he's like doing one more than he used to, you know, but it's still only four songs out of 20 something that he wants to do. Um, you know, I think he really doesn't want to be the front guy and I don't mind being the front guy, but it's really, it's a trio. It's, it's more of a triangulation and, you know, Tom for all is, um, taciturnity, if that's even a word, um, as a drummer, <laughs> you know, drummers tend to, you tend to think of as wild men, but he's like the quietest guy. He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to, doesn't want to be out there on interviews or anything. Well, so, I yeah, I mean, we don't really allocate the songs. It's more like, oh, here's Chris brought four that are really five that are really good that we want to do you know yeah i mean you gave tom you gave tom the band name so you know think, yeah there you go yeah. i think i think from that point on he can uh <laughs> he can just hit things um yeah. so the re is the record may 31st uh yes yeah and when when he comes to the uk that's the big question You're uh in, uh first first week of october i believe were there La lafayette I don't. I, I know where Lafayette is. I, I don't think I've been. I think. I think Lafayette is near me. Since the pandemic, I've completely, I've completely lost track of where anything is in London because occasionally mm. I'll venture into the centre of town and I'll be like, "Oh, that that place I used to go to for twenty years is is closed down." So, um, but no, I will. I will inevitably be at, at Lafayette. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, great. Yeah, we. Um, I, I haven't been there either. It's a smallish room, like five hundred or so, five six hundred, and. Uh, we sold it out relative, very quickly, I should say, already, because it's not even coming till October. So there was even talk of like, well, sure, we have done a bigger room or add another night, but I think we're just going to leave it there for now. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you was uh, Islington Town Hall, which will be, I think that was around the time of Skins, I think. But anyway. yeah, we did a, we did another uh, show in London in in, in between those at. Um, uh, what the hell was it? Uh, something electric? Is there something electric or? Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I and I saw. I think before that it was Islington Academy. Hey, I tell you what, I meant to tell you. Are you aware that uh, Treehouse turned up on the Apple TV show for All Mankind? Yeah, yeah. We we usually have to sign off on these things. Yeah. I I I just love that show, and I was watching it with my wife, and I got very excited. But it was it was soundtracking the people who, and here's a spoiler: it was soundtracking the the people plotting to blow up NASA. And I was a little <laughs> bit like I I was thinking I can't imagine that terrorists are too fond of Buffalo Tom. It just doesn't seem like they're vibing. I haven't seen it yet. I I, I should watch it though. Yeah. Well, I, I've I have ruined that. Spoiler for you. I think I've just well, really yeah. three for you. I'll, I'll forget it by the time I get off this call here. <laughs> uh, Bill, listen, it's been a real treat to speak to you. Thanks so much for uh, giving me some time. Uh, same here, James. Take care of yourself.